Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast. This is Thought Leaders with Joe Craig. My guests today are Brad Meltzer and Josh Mensch, authors of The First Conspiracy, The Secret Plot to Kill George Washington. Brad Meltzer is the number one New York Times bestselling author of The Escape Artist, The Inner Circle, and many other bestselling thrillers, as well as the Ordinary People Change the World series. He's also the host of History Channel TV shows Brad Meltzer's Decoded and Brad Meltzer's Lost History, which he used to help find the missing 9-11 flag that the firefighters raised at Ground Zero. His co-author is Josh Mensch, who's a writer and documentary television producer with a focus on American history and culture. He's produced, written, and directed series for PBS, National Geographic, A&E, Discovery, and other networks. He was also the showrunner on Brad Meltzer's Lost History for the History Channel. Josh is a graduate of Princeton and Columbia Universities and lives in Brooklyn with his families. Gentlemen, welcome. Great to be here. Thank you. So uh, just first to start off, how did you come to work on this project? Uh, I found this story uh, nearly a decade ago in the place where all great stories are hidden, which is in the footnotes. And I remember finding this footnote that talked about a secret plot to kill George Washington. And my first thought was, you know, is this real? Is it fake? Why does no one know this? Um, And it was real. There was in 1776 a plot to go after George Washington. When George Washington found out about it, they eventually rounded up those responsible, took one of the co-conspirators. They built a gallows and hung him in front of 20,000 people, the largest public execution at that point in North American history. George Washington brought the hammer down, and I was fascinated with it, um, and went to Pulitzer Prize winning author Joseph Ellis, um, and said, you know, why are there no books on this, and what do you think about the story? And, and I will say, five years went by, and I couldn't shake it, mm-hmm. and when five years go by with a story, that's when I know I got to do it, um, and I eventually, after five years, went to, went to Joseph Ellis and, and said, you know, is this, what's the story with this story? And he said to me, you know, this is a story about George Washington's spies. And you can find, he explained, all of the slaves and the number of slaves that George Washington owned, but you'll never find all his spies. By its nature, he explained, what you're looking for will forever be elusive. And he said, you know, listen, try doing it. If you, if you succeed, you get a book. If not, you have an adventure. You'll learn something. And that seemed like a good deal. And, and Josh and I, a couple of years earlier, had worked on this TV show, Lost History. Right. And we went searching for lost historical artifacts, uh, including the 9-11 flag that the firefighters raised at Ground Zero. And we were lucky enough to help find the flag. We unveiled it in the 9-11 Museum on the 15th anniversary of 9-11. But one thing that I knew when we were doing the show is Josh was not just the executive producer, but he was the best writer and the best researcher that we had. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember calling him up and saying, I have this idea. I want to do a book about the secret plot to kill George Washington. And he was like, um, Brad, I've never written a book. Right. And I was like, neither did I at one point. Don't let that stop you. Um, and, the, and the publisher had sent me all these different writers who had written books, but they just didn't have that voice that Josh had. Um, and then I'll throw it to Josh, because I'm sure he has a, a very different version of events. <laughs> <laughs> the version is very much the same. Brad and I <clears throat> met uh, making a television show together, mm-hmm. uh, and we instantly shared some of the same passions, a passion for storytelling and also a real passion for American history and a love of American history. Uh, so we would stayed in touch after that show, and um, uh, he did call me rather out of the blue and say, uh, this will be the most interesting phone call you'll hear today. Uh, and I said, what is it, Brad? And he said, have you ever thought about writing a book? Um, and at the time, it had been a long, long time since I thought about writing a book. But we, uh, he told me the story. And uh, I had done some previous research on this era, but didn't know much about this story. So initially, we both just started researching it and learning more and got to the point where we felt like there really is a real story here. Um, A lot of the story has been shrouded in rumors, shrouded in myth, there are tall tales about it, Mm -hmm. Uh, but neither of us could find a really serious um, treatment of the story uh, or a book written about the story for a long time. And so it really took some digging digging in original documents uh, to find what really happened and for us to know that we could move forward and tell this entire story. It is quite an amazing story, and now our, our, our audience is naturally interested in uh, the story beginning at June 14th, 1775, the birth date of the Army, and then, uh, you know, the next day, Washington is selected to be the Commander-in-Chief, and then it's going to head off to meet his Army up in Massachusetts. 
uh, as a book guy, I'm personally interested that he ordered up some military strategy text before he heads out. But uh, no, nope, that was. But let's talk about that a moment. With that, you know, let's. Uh, that was one of my Elmore Leonard used to the famous writer had this way of advice about writing books, and he said you got to leave out the parts that everyone skips over, and you got to put in the good parts that people like to read. Mm-hmm. It's good advice. Um, what I used to say about Josh is that he was really good at finding the good parts. And I remember when he sent me, you found um, that when George Washington first gets chosen, he starts ordering books on how to be a good general and military, you know, strategy. And, and which, you know, it's almost like it feels like the 1776 version of the, you know, the idiot's guide, right? Like, it's just like you can see in that moment that he's trying to learn. Try, you know, this isn't George Washington, the, the 2.0 version who wins the war. But it's the 1.0 version who's like, oh, my gosh, I have to do this, who says, I don't know if I'm up to this task, who leaves the room and, and you know, is worried and has that, that level of modesty that, to me, is so impressive. Right. Um, I think that is, of course, the most interesting part. Yeah, and, and we saw that, you know, from his reliance on reading for like, the rules of civility and decent behavior, that he is a guy who learned from reading and, and was able to guide his he didn't just read them, would copy them over and over. Um, 110, I think it is, rules. Uh, the rules they used to write over and over were, uh, they're great rules because they say, one of them is don't spit on people when you're talking to them um, <laughs> and don't pick your teeth in public. Mm. Still good rules for all of us today. But Most of are, them still apply. Yes, yeah, yeah, especially in my family. Um, but there are rules about humility and about kindness and about you know uh, modesty that are vital and I think become those kind of building blocks of who he comes to be. Absolutely. Yeah, he's certainly focused on character and, and his... Uh in his uh, career, so. Uh, so, you know, he does get these books. Uh, ideally, he goes through some kind of cram session and heads off, and on the way, he stops in New York and has a rather strange coincidental meeting with the, the Governor William Tryon, uh, Tryon coming in at the same time. Can you tell us about that and what's going on? Yeah. Sure, well, yeah, by, by remarkable coincidence, um, uh, George Washington is on his way up to Boston from Philadelphia. Uh, and one of their big stops along the way, uh, and he hasn't even met his army yet. He's on his way to Boston to meet his army, and he's with his new officers, and they do a parade in New York City on their way. And it just so happens that on the very same day, uh, on the very same day that uh, Washington is crossing through New York City and doing this parade in Manhattan, uh, the governor, William Tryon, the royal governor, has just returned from England. Uh, and of course, William Tryon, the governor, is on the side of the British, and he does not appreciate that this, you know, rebel leader right. is parading through his city. So right there, you have these two characters in the city together on the same day, and William Tryon is like, "Where's my parade? I'm the governor." <laughs> so they're in the city on the same day, and in our book, that kind of starts this. This is a moment in which uh, these two opposing characters are, are together at the same time, and. In the book, we trace that relationship because uh, William Tryon will eventually be the one who, who masterminds this uh, plot against Washington. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly indicative of the divided loyalties of the city at the time. Yeah. I'm on that, and, and I think for me, what was you know, worth really focusing on is it's not just telling the story, but telling the story why it matters to us today. And we're such a divided country today in many ways. And uh, when you look back, we always want to look back at the good old days where it was different. But at that time, there were, you know, in New York City, there were nearly as many loyalists on the British side as there were on the Patriot side. And in our own military um, was divided because you had these different regiments. We weren't even wearing the same uniforms. And uh, I think it's really vital to kind of see that, that chaos that George Washington was dealing with as he's trying to bring this all together. Yeah, I mean, we, we see that challenge to try to bring the army together once he gets up to Boston and is dealing with the different regiments. And yeah, that scene in Harvard Yard, there's this wonderful scene um, that George Washington is in Harvard Yard and the, the Marbleheads are getting there and Massachusetts Regiment's there and then here comes the Virginia Regiment and the Virginia Regiment has some kind of a frilly thing on their uniform uh, and a fight breaks out because fights break out. And George Washington races in, jumps off his horse, and basically grabs these guys. And I'm, of course, paraphrasing here, but it's like, you know, stop fighting each other. You're on the same team. Yeah, I think he said he was like holding holding him by, holding the, by neck. the neck. He's literally <laughs> throttling him. And, and, and what, I, what I love is if ever there was a, a, a metaphor for where we are today as a culture, there it is, right? We're on the same team. And, and there was no United States back then. Mm-hmm. George Washington had to help build it, and he built it through character and through trying to bring all this chaos together. 
And, you know, following that time, when, when he's up there in Boston, there's a rather unusual uh, situation that comes up where he's presented with, uh, by a baker, uh, there's a prostitute involved, oh. and a secret letter. Can you expand on that? Uh, sure. Well, one of the, you know, fun stories early in our book um, is about one of the first kind of scandalous acts of espionage in the American Revolution. Um, and there is a, a, a doctor in Boston or in Cambridge, uh, Dr. Church, who, uh, in fact, had been appointed the Surgeon General of the Army. And it turns out that for not just months but years, he had been secretly funneling information to the British. Um, and he was a very respected patriot. He was held in high esteem. Everyone trusted him. He went to a lot of important meetings. He had access to important information and intelligence, and the whole time he was secretly ferrying this information, uh, in some cases through his mistress, who was a prostitute, uh, to the British generals. Mm -hmm. And uh, through a crazy uh, twist of events that I can't possibly describe on this podcast uh, because it's so convoluted, uh, they find out. And George Washington, it was one of the real first acts of betrayal um, in, the, in the army. And uh, George Washington had to confront this man who had betrayed, you know, not just the army, but the colonies. Right. And not just what they also figure out is when they're trying to, you know, they open his le the letter that's been written and they're trying to decode um, the secret code that's in there. And they realize they don't even have any code breakers. Mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 of course, take for granted today that we have all these systems in place. And, I, and it's very titillating to say we got the, you know, that the first conspiracy is about the secret plot to kill George Washington. But what I love is you get to see the birth of our counterintelligence agencies kind of, you know, you see the first glimpse of, of them here. Wait, we need code breakers. Yeah, no Wait, we need specialties, that, right? Yeah, no, no. And, and you, you need these specialties to come in. And this is, listen, this is where, you, where they, they figure out for that first time. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we should get a couple on staff. And in j just as a, as a larger point, uh, so much of this reveals how, how hard it was to create an entire army from scratch. They had nothing. There were colonial militias, uh, but they were scattered. Uh, George Washington has to literally create uh, a brand new army mm -hmm. and an intelligence service. And they had to figure out the chain of command. They had to figure out all the logistics. It was basically 12,000 young men who showed up with the shirts on their backs, right. sometimes not even the shirts on their backs, and they had to figure out how to house them, how to feed them, how to clothe them, how to, you know, what are we gonna do tomorrow with 12,000 people? And uh, you really under appreciate the logistical difficulty of it and what they were up against fighting, you know, the greatest military force in the world at the time. Right. And one of the other things that he had to create at the time was his own bodyguard. So. Can you tell us about the lifeguards? How were they selected? Yeah. What were their duties? This was my favorite, I, I, and Josh knows this, is George Washington had his own private bodyguards. He asked all of his uh, regiments to, the leaders of them, and said, give me your four best men. And he wanted what they called drilled men. And drilled men were the best of the best, you know, uh, reached certain levels of, of, you know, just being the best at all these different things. And Washington himself personally took those and reduced them to a, approximately 50 people. And those became the general's guards, the commander's guards, what eventually became known as the name that stuck, the lifeguards, mm -hmm. because part of their job was to truly guard George Washington's life. And these were among the men who turned on him. These were the ones who uh, Governor Tryon and Mayor Matthews were able to pull over to their side. Um, I obviously don't want to ruin the whole plot to say how and where and why it you know, happens, but you know, I always warn people, you know, you should never know, we'll never know what George Washington thinks. And you'll see a lot of history books say, oh, George Washington thought this and he thought that. And he wasn't a man who, you know, wrote his feelings like Jefferson or Adams in, in letters where you knew everything that he was thinking at all times. Mm -hmm. But I don't care how strong you are and I don't care what a great general you are. I don't care that you become the first president um, when your own men turn on you. The ones you've hand-selected personally yourself, that has to be a moment that is devastating right. to George Washington. Right. And, and he's seeing evidence of other betrayals. So, I mean, down in, in New York at the time, his commanders are finding out about plots and examples of sabotage, right? Right. And you're seeing church, as we just talked about, you're, you know, there's not just beyond sabotage, but people close to him who he's like, I trusted that man, and now he's on the other side. And, and that immediately, you know, what you start seeing is is George Washington develop um, this these small committees 
to take care of it. He needs secret committees. He, he knows, of course, we need a good offense in the same way the Army operates today. We need an offense. You need that military might out there, but you also need a good defense because there are people who are coming after you from different ways that you, you know, if you're not ready for them, they are going to take you out. And you start, they launch, um, they take on many names and they started more people and then reduced down. One of the he launches a secret committee. The initial name is the Committee on Intestine Enemies, okay. which is, I'm convinced, the worst name for a secret committee ever. Not involving tapeworms. Right, not involving tapeworms. So the intestine enemies uh, luckily get a brand new name, and they become the Committee on Conspiracies, right. which is a good name for a secret committee. Uh, it is led by John Jay, and there's Governor Morris and Philip Livingston are the three men that eventually become the ones that they rely on. And... It's these men kind of lead the charge to investigate what's happening. And you'll see, you know, there's midnight raids and they're pulling out witnesses and they're interrogating them and trying them and figuring out information. But what, you, what they're really doing is they're birthing the first counterintelligence agency in the United States. And there was no United States then, but in, in early America. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's, you know, so wonderful about it is to watch what John Jay does. And we all love to point to the CIA and they'll tell you that the precursor to the CIA is the OSS. Um, but in reality, it, it all stems from here, these moments in revolutionary times that you see the first intelligence agencies being born. In fact, right now in CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, there is a room dedicated to John Jay, mm-hmm. who they call, I forget if he's the father, I forget if they call him the father or the grandfather of counterintelligence. Uh, the founding father. Founding father, counter- sorry. Founding, founding father, father, father counterintelligence. is the better name. Um, better than the Committee of Intestine Enemies as well. Uh, and I love that. I love that it comes from here. And we don't, I didn't know about that, right? I mean, it's just John Jay is, becomes the first Supreme Court justice, but he's really good at handing out justice, right? It's like a comic book almost. It sounds, you know, he by day, he, you know, justice on the bench, and at night, you know, meets out his own justice in the— as an investigator, it sounds almost made up, but it's real, and it happened. And um, I love that you get to see that unfold as you watch this plot unfold. Yeah. And, and so as Jay and the committee are uncovering you know, nefarious acts and plots going on, you have the British you know, expected in New York Harbor any day now. Uh, this kind of tension, but what is life like for the average soldier? Yeah, uh, it's a – well – uh, to me, that's the really other amazing part of what happens is you get to see New York where these early battles are taking place. Because um, we all know, of course, you know, we think of Boston, we think of Philadelphia, and we think of the Revolutionary War. But it's New York where those first battles when the British invade come, and it's because of the waterways there, that if you can take the waterways there, and especially on this podcast we should talk about, you can cut the colonies in half. It's almost like you're going like this. You know, I'm showing you on the podcast. If you can't see, I'm moving my hands right now, everyone. Um, but you're, you, know, you can make kind of a V formation up those waterways, and then you really sliced everything in half, and, and now you control, of course, you know, shipping in the waterways there. But you have 10,000 men in the Army coming into New York City uh, to fight. And, of course, the wealthy people who are living there leave. They're like, what, there's going to be a war here. I'm out of here. But now you got 10,000 men alone in New York City who basically do exactly what 10,000 men today would do if they were thrown into New York City. And they are drinking and they're gambling and they're going to prostitutes. And George Washington is horrified because he's a proper Virginian gentleman, a man who wrote out you know, the 100-plus rules of civility. Um, and you can see his general orders of the day, um, and I forget which one comes first, but I know it's you know it's no gambling, and he doesn't want them drinking, and stop going to pro- basically the same rules that are in my house: no drinking, no gambling, stop going to prostitutes. Um, but we you know we always tell the story of the American Revolution as you know we held hands and we came together and we loved democracy, and then we won, and that was the end, and everyone lived happily ever after. Um, but this was chaos and, and, and trying to bring these men together. They were, you know, to create rules, to create order, um, just to create the, the, you'll see all the general orders in there, but the ones that come out, and Josh, you should talk a little bit about them, are, are just to put, you know, kind of, we all know the army is so beautifully organized, but this is when there's, again, an army with no rules and no order yet, and you're seeing the first ones come down, and part of it is just to deal with, with men who are really just being young men. And the sheer magnitude. I mean, if you're talking about 10,000 soldiers coming down in a city that was originally 25,000, it, it's an invasion. Basically. Yeah, it's exactly right. And they're taking over. The, you know, there's no barracks. At the point, they're going into wealthy people's houses and squatting in there and, you know, 
dozens of them in, in you know, in, in these apartments and in, in these buildings. Yeah, so uh, one thing we really loved about this story was the New York angle to it and, and, and the feeling that was in the city at the time. And it was such a great backdrop for this story uh, because you have so much distrust. You have uh, loyalists and you've got patriots. You've got spying. You have all these soldiers who uh, you know, are breaking every single one of those 100 rules of, of civility on a daily basis. And George Washington trying to control it all under enormous pressure because the British are on their way. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's when this plot breaks out. And so New York at that moment, it could not have been more tense. Uh, it could not have been uh, more unpredictable what would happen. And George Washington's right there at the center of it. And you know the future is in everyone's hands. And no one knows what's going to happen. And we just love that backdrop to the story. Right. And, and I will say, I, I also, you know, my favorite part, maybe we're going to get there, but is, is watching George Washington as that early general because we, we again what we do in America with our heroes and um, whether it's historical mi heroes or military heroes is we, we dip them in granite we build statues to them and they become these dead figures something we look up to but they're not people anymore and we lose something when we do that um, because every person you look up to and whether it's George Washington or Rosa Parks or Dr. King or, you know, anyone else that you've met in, in your military experience, um, every hero you look up to at one point was scared and terrified and worried they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And they continue to. And I love the fact, if it, you know, if it was easy, everyone would do it. With George Washington in this moment, and we see the Battle of Brooklyn in, in the first conspiracy, and it's a moment where we get, they wipe the floor with us. George Washington gets outgeneraled. He doesn't have the experience that the British generals have. Um, we barely have, you know, we, we can't keep up. And it's a moment where George Washington could have easily, you know, banged his chest and said, you know, I'm the best there is, um, and I'm going to show them how great I am by going out in a blaze of glory. I'm going to take as many as I can with me, and we're going to show them what's what. And instead of, you know, doing the macho move in that moment, George Washington does the best thing he always does, is he adapts. And he plans the daring escape. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the night, he's got the British in front of him. He's got the East River behind him. He's pinned. This, he's, this should be the end. This is, it's all over. Um, but they commandeer every nearby boat they can find. And on the East River, uh, in the middle of the night, they start putting their men on the boats. But here's the key moment. Is George Washington won't get on any of the boats until his men are on first. And his men see that he's willing to risk his life for theirs. And, and again, not that it's the singular moment that changes all of history. There are too many that come before and after that. But it is one of those key moments where you see what leadership is. Um, I wrote in one of my books, and uh, my friend Simon Sinek said it so well, and I used it in I Am George Washington. Leadership is not about being in charge. It's about taking care of those in your charge. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely... An example there, it's showing George Washington as an exemplar. Um, were his lifeguards uh, hand selected by Washington similarly exemplars for the army? Uh, you know, not the four that turned on him, <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, I, I assume, you know, it's funny, we met someone, was it last night or was it in New York? I forget who, who said that they had a relative who was in the, was in last the lifeguards night. last night. Um, and this is the beauty of when you do a book like this and you're on tour. There's a moment in the book um, about George Washington's uh, housekeeper at the time who's taking care of the housewoman named Mary Smith. Right. And, you know, it, this is a, the first nonfiction full book I've ever worked on. And, and in, in my fictional thrillers, if I don't like how the story's going, I change the story. If I don't like that character, I kill the character. Mm -hmm. I have full control over what happens. But when you write a nonfiction book like The First Conspiracy— you, you can't change the facts. This is nonfiction. And I remember we got to Mary Smith, and, and they think she might be in on the plot. She disappears in the middle of the night. Some people will tell you she was in on it. She was a prostitute. She was a horrible girl. You can find a million things that they say about her. Um, none of them can be proven. But she disappears in the middle of the night, which is just odd. She just It's like she just is erased from history and never heard from again. We can't track her. And you can write whatever you want and make, you know, whatever play whatever scary music you want to play to make people go like, oh, my gosh, that's how close they were to killing him. But... We don't know if she was involved with the plot at all, and we acknowledge that there, we just don't know. There are going to be parts of the story that we'll just never know what happened to her. But what I love, and I'm thoroughly convinced the same way Lost History worked as a TV show, is that as we go around, 
there's going to be someone as we tell this story, and I'm hoping someone listening to this, whose great-great-grandmother, great-great-great-great, um, was Mary Smith, and who says, I know what happened to her. She's related to us. Mm-hmm. And will tell us, no, she actually moved to Connecticut and became a whatever she became and had however many kids or whatever she did. Um, I love the fact that history is kind of this thing that keeps growing and it keeps changing and it's never just you know this one story that can only be interpreted one way and that's not the bad part of it that's the best part of it because it our history is us it's just like us it's constantly moving and evolving and figuring itself out right. well, are there any uh, final lessons that uh, you took away from your experience working on the book well, uh, for one, just what an incredibly uh, fascinating period this is. And, of course, we all know it. It's 1775, 1776. It's a key moment in American history. But when you really delve in deeply, uh, the layers to it, the complexity of it, the characters, uh, the color, there's so much there. And I, I think what was fun about this story is, is we, we get to really follow George Washington from the moment he takes command through the Declaration of Independence and then the Battle of Brooklyn kind of at the end. Uh, you know, the, one of the most seismic years in American history, and we see most of it through George Washington's eyes, and we also tell this crazy, convoluted conspiracy story. And through those two threads, it feels like we really open up a world and, and get to live in it for a while and kind of breathe it and smell it and see it and think about it. And uh, it was just a great pleasure to, uh, to learn this story and to, and to find a fun way to tell the story, and we hope that's what readers uh, take away from it. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll leave the details of how the plot is uncovered uh, for readers to, to Oh, we're discover. not telling you that for one second. Mm-hmm. You're going to, you know, the thing that's great is, and I'll leave the tease with this, is the day gets saved by the least likely person you're ever going to imagine. And it's just an ordinary person who at one day, at this one moment, at this crossroads of history is sitting in the right place at the right time and hears the greatest story ever told. And I love that history potentially changes right there in that moment. And, and I was impressed with the crossroads of history where, you know, when the, after the day of the execution is the same morning that John Adams is presenting the first draft of the declaration to the... As the British are literally coming, right? right? I mean, those are the headlines of the day. That's why this becomes a footnote. Yeah, and that's our part of our argument is that actually June 28th, 1776 should be remembered as one of the most eventful days in American history, along with some of the other, those other famous dates. Yeah. And I think we prove it in the book. <laughs> well, from now on, I'll certainly raise a glass on June 28th to celebrate as well. That's right. You can go to the baker and you can get your, uh, your prostitute-infested muffins there. <laughs> well, I follow the same rules at home as you. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> All hundred rules of civility, right? <laughs> All right. Well, um, what an amazing story. Uh, I want to I thank you both, Brad Meltzer and John Mensch, for being our guests today. Please go out and buy their book, The First Conspiracy, The Secret Plot to Kill George Washington. Thanks for having us on. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. It certainly was. And thanks. let me also say very quickly, thank you to everyone listening. Um, I'm one of the thriller writers who's been lucky enough to come and do USO events in the Middle East, um, all over the world, and I am honored every single time I get to do one. Uh, and just know we never forget you here. And to all our listeners, uh, thanks for joining. Be sure to subscribe to Army Matters Podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. Visit AUSA.org for more info. And keep it locked right here for all Army Matters and for next week's episode with Soldier Today. And have a great Army Day.